mate, so uh, you, like, I suppose what we're asking there is that it seems that you said that Trump was no longer relevant in the political conversation. He was no longer the lightning rod. He was no longer the berserker of American politics. Loads of people on our platform absolutely love Donald Trump. Trump. They see him as the solution to America's problems. They see him as the great swamp drainer. It seems you have occupied varying positions on Trump at various yeah. times. Um, wh where are you on Donald Trump now? And particularly perhaps how that relates to the emergence of radical anti-establishment figures within the Democrat Party, notably RFK. Uh, where am I on Trump now? Well, I, I love Trump. Um, personally, I, you know, I think looking back on this 10 years from now, assuming we're still around, uh, I think we're going to see Trump's emergence as, as the most significant thing to happen in American politics in 100 years because he reoriented the Republican Party um, against the wishes of Republican leaders. Uh, but when I think about Trump right now, so it's July of 2023, you know, I'm struck by his foreign policy views. You know, Trump is the only person um, with stature in the Republican Party, really, who's saying, wait a second, you know, w why are we supporting an endless war in Ukraine? And that, you know, leaving aside whether Trump's going to get the nomination or get elected president or would be a good president, you know, I can't even assess that. All I can say at this point is I'm so grateful that he has that position. He's right. And everyone in Washington's wrong. Everyone. Mm. And Trump is right on that question. And it's a big question. And Trump alone among popular figures in both parties understands that. And I'm grateful for it. Whether he gets the nomination or gets elected, it, you know, words really matter. Saying something true out loud matters. And he is saying true things about Ukraine and God bless him. For democracy. <laughs> That's my favorite. It's for democracy. Okay. Say to people who hate democracy. Um, and he said, I've got seven children and they all love me. I don't care. Wow. And I thought, though, okay. You want us to distill my values into a sentence? That's the sentence. So I, I really admire him. I don't agree with him on everything. I do agree with him, I'll just be honest, on most things, on the big things. Yeah. Um, and so, no, I, I love what he's doing. I love his bravery, uh, which is just remarkable. The amount that man has suffered for what he thinks is true the area where you and I most plainly and overtly align, perhaps other than the belief in God, I suppose, is our deep understanding that the military industrial complex and big pharma are able to exert significant power over the Democratic Party, a uh, democratic process that renders ordinary electoral politics basically meaningless. Yes. Things. One, the United States has had precisely in 250 years almost one populist president and that was teddy roosevelt the most also the most popular president in american history who was president from 1901 the president was who he served as vp was was shot to death uh until 1908 most popular president the united states ever had and he was a populist the two biggest populist figures in the moment are trump and Bobby Jr., and then we had a guy called Ross Perot run about 30 years ago who roughly had the same politics. All four of those figures had one thing in common. They were all from the world they criticized. Div populists are the ones who critique from the inside and say, I grew up in this world. Teddy Roosevelt grew up rich, of course, in New York. Trump, Perot, Bobby, I mean, Bobby Kennedy's family is the most faint, one of the most famous families in the world in modern history, the Kennedys, and certainly the most famous family in democratic politics. So these are people who know how the system works because they've benefited from the system. And so their critique is much more meaningful and much more effective, I would say, because they can bear witness to what they have seen. I think Trump has changed politics in Washington. I think the parties both have been very resistant to any kind of reform, and that's very foolish. That's a Ceausescu move. You see things changing around you and you just, you can't metabolize it. You can't sort of change with the moment. And then you, you know, you meet a bad end when you become that rigid. I think that Bobby Kennedy and Trump will both have a very tough time getting the nomination. I'm hoping that both of them will, of course, I guess. Uh, I'm hoping that their message will be heard. I don't know. I don't even know what I hope for in the process itself, but I want them to be heard. And they can now be heard because there are channels of information that people can tune into and listen. I mean, I would just, I would just 
I would amend one thing you said when you said that, you know, these huge multinationals control our politics. Well, they also control our media. Yeah. They do. I mean, pharma, as you well know and often say on your show, is the biggest advertiser on American television. It's probably true in the UK as well. And so, you know, there's no incentive whatsoever to question their products. And now we have, because of the social media companies, Twitter and Rumble and probably others, we have less filtered sources of information with fewer gatekeepers and a, and a higher probability you'll hear something true. I think that's a huge change. I mean, how can you, I mean, this is like Samus Dot. This is like, you know, this is like information that the people in charge don't want you to see. And now you can see it. It really is the promise of the internet finally fulfilled.